This is your USMNT Abroad Weekend update from February 9th to February 11th of 2024. Hi, if you're new here, I'm Filippo, and welcome to Tactical Manager TV, and welcome to the US Men's National Team Abroad series, where every single Monday we update you on how the Yanks did abroad over the weekend. Now, before we start this episode, there's one thing I'd like to say. I very often consider myself to be someone that's very optimistic because you know i firmly believe that it's never too late in life to start anything or just to take action you can start your own business when you're 50 you can run your first marathon when you're 35 it's also never too late to quit the job you hate and possibly become homeless it's also never too late to open your only fans account and no i'm not starting an only fans account and actually i want to take that one back depending on how old you are, like let's say you're around the same age as the average age of the past two US presidents. If that's the case, you might be a little bit too late to start an OnlyFans account. I, I don't think anyone would sign up for that. But anyhow, as I said earlier, I'm very optimistic and I think it's never too late to take action and get something done. And this weekend, we got actual proof that it's never too late to take action. The Ivory Coast fired their coach in the middle of the African Cup of Nations and won the tournament, proving to US soccer that it's simply never too late to fire Greg Berhalter. It's also never too early, like they could fire him right now. But I wouldn't get mad at US soccer if they fired Berhalter in the middle of the Copa America. Even if we qualify, just, just fire him, it's, it's not too late. Before we start, I also wanna give massive props to Sebastian Haller for beating cancer, coming back to play professional soccer and scoring the goal that gave his country the African Cup of Nations. Those are the stories that really make this game more than just a sport, so I wanna give a shout out to Sebastian Haller. With that said, make sure to drop a like in this video if you want to. Let's try to hit 1,000 likes. And probably this week, me and Dustin will do a massive channel announcement, which I can't spoil what it is in this video, but we'll get to that later in this week. Drop a like and let's begin. As always, we start with the Americans that play in the Premier League. With that said, why don't we go to Nottingham Forest and talk about Giovanni Reina and Matt Turner. And on Saturday, Gio Reina and Matt Turner both start off the bench for Nottingham Forest during their 3-2 loss to Newcastle. Matt Turner stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes while Gio Reina was subbed in around minute 73. The US men's national team Nottingham Forest marriage is off to a rough start. But we're not gonna file for divorce yet. We shall seek therapy for the kids. As for Reyna's performance, he was sent in to try to help them pull a late draw as they were already down 3-2. He played as a 10 or a central attacking midfielder with a lot of freedom to roam. He was pushed a bit higher up the field for this match with Morgan Gibbs White dropping deeper and Reyna did fine. He helped set up his teammates. He hit a shot that was blocked, helped the team hold possession. He was good in my opinion. There's only so much he can do with that amount of time and with this specific team and their style of play. A player of Gio Reyna's profile doesn't really suit you know Nottingham Forest's game and that's what continues to concern me and I know some of you will say it's just two games he just got here that's an overreaction from tactical manager but here's the thing it's not just two games their style of play has been like that all season long if you've been following and watching Nottingham Forest because Matt Turner was playing that's literally how they've been playing all season long so it's not an overreaction to two games it's an overreaction to their entire season actually I don't even think it is an overreaction. Could Gio do fine there? Maybe. He just doesn't really suit their game. And that's the concern I had when the transfer happened. And, and, and I talked about it extensively. So it's not an overreaction because of two games. It's a regular reaction because of their entire season. This team has no combination play, no ability in tight spaces, no control of the tempo of the game. They're more of a run, 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 get a steal, hit the opponent in transition, and whip in crosses. They improved a little bit under Nuno Spiritu Santo, their current manager, but this team is still a mess. And sure, I agree with you that Gio Reyna can improve them, but there's only so much one player can do in a sport that involves 11 players on the field. All I'm saying is look at Giovanni Reyna's player profile and tell me where does he fit for this team and their proposed style of play based on the players that they have 
tell me, does he fit their playing style with his player profile? I honestly don't know. I guess time will tell. The good news here is that he's only on a loan, so he'll be out in a few months. Just so you know my answer, I don't think his player profile fits the style of play of Nottingham Forest. I said this multiple times. Does his talent match it? Of course. I think he's more than enough talented to play for a team like Nottingham Forest. Just the style of play that they're proposing doesn't work for Gio Reyna, in my opinion. I hope I'm wrong. The next player would have been Chris Richards, but they played this Monday. So if you're watching Chris Richards play while you're watching this video, drop a comment down below because we record this on Sunday night. And Richards will be playing for Crystal Palace and they face Chelsea. Next up, we have Austin Trusty that plays for Sheffield United. And on Saturday, Trusty was benched for Sheffield United and he stayed there for the full 90 minutes during their 3-1 win over Luton Town. They're still in last place with this win, but now they are closer to not being last for whatever that's worth. Next up, we have A-Rob and Tim Ream from Fulham. And on Saturday, Ream and Robinson both started and played the full 90 minutes for Fulham during their 3-1 win over Bournemouth. Let's talk about Robinson first. He was great, once again. He has easily been one of the most consistent Americans in Europe alongside Wes and McKinney that plays for Juventus. I can't remember the last time these two players, McKinney and Robinson, had an actual bad performance. And my memory is sharp. My memory is as sharp as a butter knife. Even though they're not really sharp, but you get the point. Actually, you probably don't get the point. I totally messed up that analogy, so completely forget what I just said. My memory is good. Just trust me. For this match, A-Rob was rock solid defensively. He had 16 defensive actions, won all four of his ground duels, had seven clearances, five interceptions, a fantastic game. But he was also dangerous going forward with his low crosses, and he almost scored a goal with a nice shot on target in the first half. As for Tim Ream, he was also pretty damn good this game. For Fulham's first goal, Ream stepped in, got the steal, which started the play that ended up with Bobby D. Cardova Reed scoring for Fulham. And along with that, Ream and Robinson had no blame on the goal that Fulham conceded. I thought both of them played very well this weekend. And that's it for England. Let's go to Italy and talk about the Americans that play in the Italian first division, the Serie A. The first two being Christian Pulisic and Yunus Musa from Milan. On Sunday, Pulisic started and played 81 minutes for Milan during their 1-0 win over Napoli. As for Yunus Musa, he came off the bench around minute 65 and he sort of played his role. He did okay, even though there was a moment that Pioli seemed very angry at Musa, but I'm trying not to read into it too much because it can just happen. Maybe Musa made a silly mistake but Pioli didn't really seem happy as for Christian Pulisic he didn't really have a great game he wasn't terrible by any means but just very ineffective I would say lots of hustle got fouled a few times but I hold him to a higher standard and because of that I know he can do much better and he just hasn't really been good Christian Pulisic is also currently going through a goal drought with Milan. Pulisic has yet to score a single goal in the Serie A in 2024. The last time he scored the, in the Italian First Division was back in December 30th of 2023. It's been eight matches since. And yes, Loftus-Cheek did screw over Pulisic during the match, but I won't dive into this game too much. I want to address why Pulisic's productivity has gone down lately. And keep in mind, what I'm about to tell you, I, I don't know exactly when this started, but I think Pioli changed his tactics a little bit, and that's what screwed over Pulisic a little bit. It seems like Pioli has been keeping Rafael Leon higher up the field on the left, so Milan can strike and transition through that side of the field with Leon and Teo Hernandez, which is definitely far more dangerous than Pulisic going with, I don't know, Calabria. While Pulisic has been tracking back a lot lately. He's been very deep and helping on defense. Earlier this season, I noticed Pulisic was higher up the field, so he would be more involved in transition. That's how he got a few assists. And he could also be closer to Giroud, which is a player that he combines well, and that led to a few goals and assists here and there. I do also want to add that Leon is a brilliant player, and he has a brilliant player to combine with. Theo Hernandez. That was the goal that Milan even scored this match. Pulisic has to combine with Calabria, Florenzi that are sort of mediocre fullbacks for that level. I'm not giving excuses as Pulisic has actually not been great in 2024, but I'm also trying to add some context to why his productivity might have gone down. It's not all on the tactics, but that is one of the reasons. Pulisic has been dropping very deep and helping on defense way too much. He's a little too far from the opponent's goal as he has to track back, and I think that's affecting his productivity. Now, the next two players would have been Weston McKinney Kenny and Tim Weah from Juventus, but they played this Monday. So if you're watching the game, also drop a comment on how Weston McKenney and Tim Weah did for Juventus, because as I said, we always record on Sunday nights. Okay, now before we continue, you can drop a like and a quick word from our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Their link is on the description. We'll be back in a minute. 
And thank you, Underdog Fantasy, for sponsoring Tactical Manager TV. Underdog Fantasy is a fun game to play prior to any soccer match, or basketball, or football as well, but we don't talk about those two in Tactical Manager TV. Sometimes basketball during live watch-alongs. I have been playing Underdog Fantasy for over a year now. You can download the app by using the link on the description of this video and you can also use the promo code TMTV. And Underdog will be matching your first deposit for up to $100. And in the process, you'll be helping the channel avoid bankruptcy. The game I mainly play is called Pick'em. You just click on it, scroll to the soccer section, and pick a player for a specific match and select the stats that you believe will be lower or higher. It's very easy to play, but be smart about your picks because it's not easy to win. I'll be playing some underdog fantasy during some match live streams or match live watch-alongs, so stay tuned for that as I will be forced to cheer for a player or root against him. Now, I am a professional hater, so I'll probably be rooting for the player's downfall. Once again, don't forget to use the promo code TMTV and use the link on the description of this video. Thank you, Underdog Fantasy, for sponsoring the channel. Next up, we have the Americans that play in Germany in the Bundesliga. So why don't we start with Brendan Aronson and Kevin Paredes because Union Berlin and Wolfsburg clashed over the weekend. Ouch. That kind of hurt. On Saturday, Paredes started and played 74 minutes for Wolfsburg in what was a disappointing performance during their 1-0 loss to Union Berlin. As for Brendan Aronson, he started off the bench and was subbed in the 59th minute for Union Berlin. And boy, did he run. And he ran more. And then when he was running, he started to run more. And when he thought he couldn't run anymore, he kept on running. And as Forrest Gump would say, I just felt like running. And boy, did he run. Okay, I'm joking. Brandon Aronson wasn't that bad, but it was, again, just another Brandon Aronson-like performance. The next American would have been John Brooks from Hoffenheim, but he is suspended, or he was suspended, due to yellow card accumulation. So let's skip John Brooks and go to Joe Scali and Pifak from Borussia Mönchengladbach. On Saturday, Pifak started and played 45 minutes for Gladbach during their 0-0 draw with Darmstadt. Pifak was subbed out due to a hamstring injury, and he's expected to be out for some time. We'll have an update on that next Monday. As for Joe Scali, after a few shaky performances on defense, he was on the bench. He was benched by Gladbach, and he ended up being subbed in around minute 72. Last but not least in Germany, we have Leonard Maloney from Heidenheim. And on Saturday, Maloney started and played the full 90 minutes for Heidenheim during their 2-1 win over Werder Bremen. Maloney scored off a header from a corner to give Heidenheim a 1-0 lead. This was the first Bundesliga goal scored by Leonard Maloney. He also got a 0.41 expected assist, which means he did a decent job on setting up his teammates for goal scoring opportunities as a six. With that said, Maloney continues to be awful on the ball, but he's not a terrible player. He's a competent Bundesliga player that's been starting for a decent Bundesliga side. You just have to keep him away from the ball. No, like seriously, you know how much I criticize Tyler Adams for not being very effective on the ball? This guy, if you go watch Maloney play, he's a good defender. He hustles a lot and he's okay, but he makes Tyler Adams look like Andrea Pirlo on the ball. Like Maloney, you don't want him, you know, helping on the build out and you also don't want him on distribution. That's all I'm saying. Ederson from Manchester City, the goalkeeper, is more technical than Maloney and he's a goalkeeper, even though Ederson is more technical than a lot of players. Now let's go to the Americans that play in Spain in La Liga, the first one being Luca de la Torre from Celta de Vigo. On Sunday, Luca de la Torre started and played the full 90 minutes for Celta de Vigo during their 3-2 loss to Getafe. Still in Spain, we have an American that is on fire. He got accustomed to La Liga and adapted to La Liga fairly quickly, actually way too quick. And that is Johnny Cardoso from Real Betis. On Friday, Johnny started and played the full 90 minutes for Real Betis during their 2-0 win over Cardiz in La Liga. Now, where do I start here? Well, I'll start by saying that Johnny was picked to be the man of the match or the MVP as they called in La Liga. Defensively, he was incredible protecting that back line, cutting passing lanes, blocking shots, winning most of his ground duels. He played very well on both halves. Now, most importantly, he was the main reason they scored their first goal. He got a steal on the offensive side of the field and then he proceeds to dribble down the right flank and find William Jose with a perfect low cross so that he could strike the ball and score. You could even call that cross a pass that might have not have even been a cross, even though it kind of crossed the box, and that gave Real Betis the lead. Johnny's off to an incredible start in Spain. 
And if you have been watching Tactical Manager TV for the past 18 months, this should not be a surprise to you because we have been reporting on how, how good Johnny was doing for Internacional in Brazil, in the Copa Libertadores, and adapting to La Liga shouldn't have been a problem, and it honestly has not been a problem. Next up, we have the Americans that play in Ligue 1 in France. The first one being Fullerton Balogun from Monaco. On Sunday, Balogun started off the bench and was subbed in the 81st minute for Monaco during their 3-2 win over Nice. And I think that's how you pronounce it. I think it's Nice, even though you spell it as nice. But even if it's not Nice, I ain't saying nice for a player section or a club section, whatever, unless we see minute 69. So we're just going to call it Nice. Balogun was sent in late in the game with a 3-2 lead and his performance wasn't very good. His poor form is still very good active oh boy it's still on he missed the sitter with a wide open net roughly three to four yards from the goal there was some contact on the play but this was literally a goal scoring opportunity that was tougher to miss than to score even with a player pushing you it was a 0.9 xg shot which means 90 percent of those end up on the back of the net so floating balligan's awful form continues i'm not very concerned for the long term but it's pretty bad for the short term. Still in France, we have Emmanuel Sabi from Le Havre. On Sunday, Sabi started and played 65 minutes for Le Havre during their 1-0 loss to Rons. <sighs> Man, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I got to take some French lessons and I'll improve those pronunciations. As of now, just bear with me. So now that we're done with the top five leagues, let's go to the Americans that play in the Netherlands in the Eredivisie. The first three, I don't know why I put four here, the first three, being the PSV boys, Ricardo Pepe, Malik Tillman, and Sergino Des. Actually, now I know why I put four, because four Americans played in this game. And we'll get to the fourth one very soon. But let's start with PSV. On Sunday, Des started and played 77 minutes for PSV during their 5-1 win over Volendam. PSV had a 1-1 draw at halftime, and Des did actually waste a good goal-scoring opportunity in the first half. But obviously, that did not come back to bite them, because PSV rolled over Volendam with a 5-1 win. Tillman and Pepe were back from injury and subbed in at the 77th minute when PSV had a 3-1 lead. Roughly one minute later, Ricardo Pepe scored their fourth goal with a powerful right-footed strike. It was actually a really good shot. I've been very critical of Pepe, even though I don't think he's doing terrible by any means, but this was a very nice goal. And honestly, it was in the box, but it was not from close range by any means. There was also another American playing, and he played for Volendam, and his name is Zach Booth, the brother of Taylor Booth, and he played the full 90 minutes. With that said, let's go to another American that plays in the Eredivisie, and that is Taylor Booth from Utrecht, and boy, he's been on fire. On Sunday, Taylor started and played the full 90 minutes for Utrecht during their 4-0 win over Fortuna Sittard. Ever since Zach Booth scored on Utrecht, you know, his younger brother, Taylor, took it personally. This guy scored a hat-trick last weekend against his brother, and then now, this week, he scored a brace and got the Man of the Match award once again. The first goal was really nice. He had a nice diagonal run with a clinical finish with his left foot. And I don't know, man. It's like someone got all the Dragon Balls and brought Taylor Booth back to life because he honestly was not playing well this season. Hopefully, he keeps it up. And if he does get injured, since we're talking about Dragon Balls, he can just eat some Senzu beans and he'll be fine. Next up, we have Paxton Aronson that now plays for Vitezzi, and he made his debut. On Saturday, Paxton Aronson started and played a full 90 minutes for Vitezzi during their 3-2 loss to Heracles. I didn't watch the game, but I heard he didn't play well and he continued to get pushed around way too easily. He did, however, get a hockey assist by setting up the cross that led to a goal. I don't think I'll be watching Vitezzi this season. I got better things to do in my life. So that reporting right there is actually far more than I expected to have in regards to Paxton Aronson, but I'll keep you all updated on him. His foot mob rating was also very low, so take that with a grain of salt, as I always say, and for whatever it's worth. I, I look at foot mob to see stats, but the ratings don't always tell the full story of what happened in the game, but his foot mob rating was low. Next up, we have the Americans that play in England, the first one being Josh Sargent from Norwich. By England, I mean the EFL Championship, the English second division. And on Saturday, Sargent started and played 69 minutes. Nice. For Norwich during their 2-2 draw with QPR. Sargent scored once again, this time off a header where he dunked on Reggie Cannon 
that is currently playing for QPR. He continues to be productive in the EFL Championship. He would have easily gone over 20 goals this season if it wasn't for that ankle injury that forced him to miss 20 games. Next up, we have Haji Wright from Coventry, another American that's actually doing very well in the English second division. And on Sunday, Haji Wright started and played the full 90 minutes for Coventry during their 2-1 win over Millwall. Haji Wright had a brace this match. Sure, one of the goals was a penalty kick, but he was actually the one that drew the penalty himself. He started this match as a center forward, but he only became truly effective when they moved him to the left wing. Haji Wright currently has 10 goals and 5 assists in the English second division with 29 matches played. And I honestly would not be surprised if Greg Berhalter called Haji Wright in for the US Men's National Team March camp. And honestly, I don't really rate Haji Wright, but I think he's earned it. Next up, still in England, we have Daryl DK from West Brom. And on Saturday, DK came off the bench around minute 55 and left the game around minute 66, unfortunately due to another injury. The rumor was that he might have injured his Achilles once again, and I swear, man, at the time of this recording, we don't know. I just really hope it's not his Achilles because that would be terrible for Daryl DK, and he honestly doesn't deserve that. Regardless, we are wishing Daryl DK a speedy recovery. He has been extremely unlucky with injuries, and I hope eventually he can just be healthy and actually go on with his career. Still in the UK, we have Cameron Carter-Vickers from Celtic, but he's currently dealing with a hamstring injury, so he wasn't available for Celtic this weekend. He's expected to be back early March. And again, this weekend, I'm not going to report on the Americans that play in Belgium, the Italian second division, any of the obscure leagues. But before we move on to the Americans that play in Liga MX in Mexico, I do want to say one thing. A big thank you to Derek from the Straight Red Card for teaching me how to properly pronounce the name of the club that Gabriel Sonina currently plays. I've been calling it Yupen, but he taught me. And here it goes. It's called Oipen. Almost as if you're like a pirate saying Oipen. I don't know why I'm telling you this, but thank you, Derek. And he's probably watching the video. If you guys made it this far, drop a like in the video. Now let's talk about the Americans that play in Mexico. The first one being Alejandro Zendejas from Club America. And on Saturday, Zendejas started and played 63 minutes for Club America during their 1-0 win over Club León. And then after Zendejas, we have Cade Cowell from Chivas Guadalajara. And on Saturday, Cade Cowell started off the bench and was subbed in the 63rd minute for Chivas during their 2-1 win over Juarez. And Brendan Vasquez on Saturday was not available for Monterrey due to personal reasons. There were no reports of an injury. All right, everyone, that's all for today. And here's one announcement. This week on Friday, we do have the U.S. Men's National Team Abroad midweek update. Yes, it'll be back this Friday. So you get a USMNT Abroad episode on Monday and one on Friday. We also have a midweek episode. And at some point this week, we also have a special announcement. I want to thank you all very much for watching and have a great day.